In the Hebrew Bible, the religion and the practices of the Canaanites are often condemned by Yahweh and his prophets, and in modern Jewish and Christian tradition, the practices of the Canaanites are looked upon with disgust. However, what exactly was the Canaanite religion? Well, it's difficult to answer that because the term Canaanite religion itself is a bit problematic because the Israelites were Canaanites. To quote scholar Mark S. Smith, despite the long regent model that the Canaanites and Israelites were people of fundamentally different culture, archaeological data now cast doubt on this view. The material culture of the region exhibits numerous common points between the Israelites and Canaanites. The record would suggest that the Israelite culture largely overlapped with and derived from Canaanite culture. Furthermore, Smith suggests that over time, aspects of Israel's religion that were non yahwistic were branded as Canaanite, and thus rejected with the development of monotheism and the cult of Yahweh. This makes discussing Canaanite religion somewhat complicated as stated before, as the beliefs and the practices of the Canaanites and the Israelites were almost identical. Along with this, the term Canaanite itself is very problematic, as it was more of a geographic term referring to the boundaries of Egypt's province in the Levant, and not an ethnic term. So technically, anyone who resided in Canaan, regardless of religious practices or ethnicity, would be a part of Canaanite religion. So because of the problems associated with the term Canaanite religion, there's often confusion surrounding the religious practices of the inhabitants of the Bronze and Iron Age Levant. So to clear this up, I will give a brief summary of what Canaanite religion was, as this video will discuss the gods, concepts, and practices of the Canaanites. Also for this video, my definition of Canaanite religion will be the religious practices of the pre-Israelite inhabitants of the land of Canaan during the Bronze Age. This definition is not perfect by any means, as I will use sources from the Iron Age and discuss Iron Age practices. However, my primary emphasis will be on the Bronze Age. But how exactly do we address this religion, considering it has been extinct for multiple millennia? Well, first off, it's well known that the Canaanite religion was polytheistic, but unlike most other well-known polytheistic religions, we do not have much data in terms of mythology, unlike the Greek, Norse, and Egyptian pantheons. Because of this, we have to rely on archaeology and the literary sources we do have to form a patchwork pantheon but often this pantheon varies from source to source. This is a staple of Canaanite religion as different regions, peoples, and cities would often worship different gods and goddesses, and even in the same place, different gods would be honored. Along with this, religious syncretism was very present. During the Bronze Age, multiple different political powers would fight over Canaan. This led to massive amounts of religious syncretism, primarily with Egyptian and Hittite traditions. However, we do actually have a significant literary source that can help us piece together Canaanite polytheism, that being the Ugaritic text. Ugarit was a city in northern Syria that was destroyed around the 13th century BCE, and archaeological excavations made at Ugarit has revealed numerous texts that can help us understand Canaanite religion. Although Ugarit was not a part of Canaan proper, its religion was very closely related to that of the Canaanites. These texts found at Ugarit and other pieces of information related to Canaan's religion scattered throughout the archaeological and historical record can help us piece together what Canaan's religion was like. Defining the Canaanite pantheon is somewhat complicated. Canaan's religion was extremely fluid and evolved over time, as beliefs and practices changed. Over time, multiple gods would be elevated, while others would be degraded. Some gods were divided into multiple gods, and others merged into a single god. However, despite this nearly constant evolution, there are some elements of the pantheon that remain constant. However, before I discuss the pantheon, I would like to note that there is a ton of disagreement between scholars on many of these gods' characteristics, personalities, and other aspects. Also, there are multiple debates on the narrative of the Ugaritic text, so much of what I say here is very debatable and could be wrong. So, before we dive in, I just want to preface that. The Canaanite pantheon was somewhat of a divine family, with four tiers ranking the gods, the patron gods, the divine assembly, the gods of daily life, and messenger deities. The patron gods consisted of El, the head deity of the Canaanite pantheon, and his consort or wife, Asherah. According to the Ugaritic text, El, often associated with a bull who is a sacred animal, was the creator of the world and humankind. 
He is also often depicted and described as elderly, wise, and kind. Asherah was also alongside him bearing El, 70 sons, who would make up the second tier or divine assembly. However, they were not alone in being patron deities, as the god Baal Hadad would join them. Baal Hadad, meaning Lord of Thunder, originally was considered an outsider to the divine family, although he was granted the same status as El's sons, possibly because El was his grandfather. However, in the Ugaritic myth known as the Baal Cycle, Baal would battle the god of the sea, Yam, and would defeat him. While El originally was an opponent of Baal, after this battle he would make Baal a patron deity and constructed a palace for him. Later in the Baal Cycle, Baal would also battle Mot, the god of death, and would be defeated and presumably killed by Mot. However, Anath, Baal's sister, defeated Mot and rescued Baal from the underworld, or was resurrected. Although it is debated whether Baal truly died and was resurrected, or whether it was a different concept or event depicted in the text. Regardless, these events in the Baal cycle show how Baal was extremely popular in Canaan, and display Baal's status as king of the gods. The second tier of gods was the Divine Assembly, also known as the Cosmic Gods, and they were the children of El and Asherah. One notable goddess of this tier is the goddess Anath, the goddess of love and war. And despite being Baal's sister, she's also his wife. Despite how weird and hilarious that would be, this topic is heavily debated, as some propose that Anath was not Baal's consort. Regardless, another consort of Baal does exist, Astate, and like Anath, she also represents love and war. However, these two goddesses' identities are extremely complicated, as they are often equated between themselves and other goddesses. And after the Bronze Age, they even merge into a single goddess, Atargatis. Other gods of the second tier include Dagon, the father of Baal and the god of grain and rain, Reshef, the god of plague and pestilence, Mot, the god of the underworld, Yam, the possibly leviathan-like god of the sea, Raphael, a god of the dead that presides over an assembly of dead kings, Moloch, another god of the dead that is often associated with human sacrifice, although it is debated whether or not he's a deity, the goddess of the sun Shafash, and the less major gods of the moon, Yirak and Shega. Other gods existed as well in the lower tiers, albeit their role was somewhat minor compared to the first and second tiers. The third tier consisted primarily of craftsman gods and trader deities, however deceased men who became gods were also part of this tier. Kings, the heads of households, and other notable men such as prophets could gain this distinction as gods with their titles being called the Rephaim, and they are presided over by one of the gods of the dead, Raphael, as he hosts a banquet with these Rephaim. Along with this, the seven goddesses of childbirth, the Katharath, were also part of this tier, along with other childbirth gods. And the fourth tier is primarily composed of mainly minor messenger deities, similar to biblical angels. Outside of the Canaanite pantheon, one of the primary elements of Canaanite religion was divine patronage. In the Near East, the political system was seen as intertwined with the divine, as gods appointed kings, gave laws, and demanded sacrifices and taxes. However, the king would be subordinate to one god, his patron, which varied from city to city or kingdom to kingdom. Other gods would be subordinate to the patron god, although it does vary in complexity as the divine hierarchy mentioned earlier was present. The king's duty was to serve the gods, primarily by promoting righteousness, bringing a good quality of life to the people, and peace. If this was not done, the patron god would often punish the king and his kingdom as a whole, often by foreign militaries. While the Canaanite religion did evolve over the centuries, this concept of divine patronage would remain constant. Animal sacrifice was also an essential component in Canaanite religion, as it was prevalent in virtually all Near Eastern religions. And it involved the slaughter and burning of animals, usually at a temple altar or village high place. Animal sacrifice played an important role in the success of the royal family, as in Canaanite religion, any sort of success required some sort of permission from the gods, and this permission was granted through sacrifice. Sacrifices also served another role as they were a sign of thanksgiving to the gods and they were food to the gods. These sacrifices and other cultural rituals were also usually carried out at temples or other cultic sites, which were widespread throughout Canaan. These cultic sites often took the form of open-air altars or high places where animals would be sacrificed 
and the blood would be easily drained. Conventional religious temples were also prevalent throughout Canaan, however archaeological excavations show that different sites had very different architectural layouts for their temples. Many have noted that this probably reflects religious influence from Egypt and the Hittites, and the ethnic diversity of Canaan. To further emphasize my point, in the region of Timna in southern Israel, archaeological excavations have discovered a Canaanite temple dedicated to the Egyptian god Hathor. This goes to show how hard it is to define Canaanite religion, and how complex Canaan's religion was. Regardless of the ethnicity or the religious practices of the temples, they would serve as the backbone of religious tradition and Canaan, as festivals and rituals would be operated out of them. For example, astrology and magical rituals were widely practiced in Canaan, and rituals involving the veneration of the dead were also prevalent. Festivals were also extremely important in Canaanite religion, as there was a fall festival celebrating the harvest and the new year similar to the Jewish Yom Kippur, and a banquet festival for the elites known as Marzea was also central in Canaanite practice. However, the most well-known and controversial rituals that have been proposed that have been practiced by the Canaanites or human sacrifice and temple prostitution. Human sacrifice did take place in Canaan, although it is debatable. There are multiple types of human sacrifice in Canaanite religion. One of the most common types involved sacrifice during a military crisis, where a victim was sacrificed to the kingdom's patron deity during a besiegement to try to gain victory. Another common sacrifice called harem existed as well, where prisoners of war were sacrificed to the god of the victors. But the most well-known and controversial type of human sacrifice was infanticide, or the sacrifice of infants. No direct archaeological evidence exists proving it occurred specifically in Canaan. However, archaeological evidence does suggest that infanticide was practiced by the descendants of the Canaanites in the Phoenician colonies of the Western Mediterranean, with mass infant graves being uncovered. Although some scholars contest this is not the case, as in the ancient world, infant mortality was extremely high, and large amounts of infant graves should be expected near religious structures. Also, the primary mentions of infanticide in Canaanite religion come from the Hebrew Bible in relation to the god Moloch. However, Moloch's status as a deity is highly, highly debated. Many have recently proposed that the mention of the word Moloch is not referring to a deity, but rather a term for a specific type of sacrifice where children were passed over the fire to be sacrificed to a god. Although the conventional view that Moloch was a deity is still prominent in scholarship, and while no direct evidence points to this Moloch practice occurring, most scholars do think it was somewhat of a historical practice. However, temple prostitution on the other hand most certainly did not occur, as no evidence suggests it did. The primary pieces of evidence that temple prostitution occurred come from passages in the Hebrew Bible, but these passages are misread. Often biblical authors would use sexual language to convey idolatry, making their language here entirely metaphorical, so the biblical authors weren't necessarily referring to literal prostitution, rather spiritual prostitution. Regardless, Canaan's religion was heavily influenced by its neighbors. This is primarily seen as its practices often demonstrate religious syncretism between Canaan and its neighbors such as Egypt, the Hittites, Assyria, and many others. So to understand Canaanite religion fully, we need to understand Canaan's history during the Bronze Age. But what exactly was Canaan's situation during the time period? Well, that is a story for another time. My next video will dive deep into the history of Canaan, from its prehistory to its fall in the Bronze Age collapse. So stay tuned.